Do you see yourself living in Ukraine for the next couple of years? Or? Yeah, I do. I have no reason to go anywhere else. My family's still in Hong Kong. And, it's, and, and so we still have a house in Hong Kong. We still have a residence in Madrid. I'm going to, yeah, there's no reason for me to go anywhere else. I want this to be the last big thing of my career. We believe, though it changes often, but we believe that this is a five to six, eight year plan. Do you know that professional and personal growth continues as we age? For many entrepreneurs, the golden age of implementing new business ideas starts after 50, and life presents rare and exciting opportunities. This is the time when personal and professional growth can truly flourish, offering a new lease on life and a chance to make a significant impact. Welcome to Age of Reinvention, the podcast that uncovers the untapped potential of midlife. I'm your host, Emily Braun, and today I have the privilege of introducing Chris Exline, a remarkable entrepreneur whose story is a proof to the limitless possibilities of growth. His journey, marked by courage, resilience, adaptability, creativity, and impactful business practices, is a beacon of inspiration for all. His entrepreneurial spirit knows no bounds, and Chris even ventured into a new country during the devastating war time to launch his business. Chris Exline has dedicated a significant portion of his career to business, crafting unique enterprise in Asia with its headquarters in Hong Kong. More than two years ago, amid the turmoil of the war in Ukraine, he made a daring decision, relocating his operations to Ukraine. This move was not without its challenges, but Chris's determination and resilience allowed him to overcome them and continue to lead his business from a new international location. Chris moved not to the capital, Kiev, but to the small city of Kremenets, which is in Khmelnytsky district in Ukraine. And now leading his international business from this small place. As we mature, our perception of the world and our role in it undergoes a profound transformation. It's not that we are constantly pondering over it. Still, I believe that you experience living in Hong Kong a vastly different environment uh, from the businessmen, say, uh, American businessmen developing business on the vast territory of the United States and your latest relocation, both in business and personal aspects, have significantly shaped your worldview and perception. What can you tell us about this? One, well, Emily, it's always a blessing to talk with you. You were one of the first people I spoke with when we were kicking this idea around a couple of years ago. And it's it's an honor to be on, on this podcast. So thank you. For those of us that are over 50, and for those of us that are actually right on the doorstep of 60, as I, when I started asking our teams about reconstruction in Ukraine, what would that look like? <clears throat> How could we participate in that? Because we have unique skill sets. For, from our times in Afghanistan, Sudan, Libya, Iraq, Djibouti, Madagascar, Libya, things like that, <clears throat> that we immediately started looking at how our furniture rental business could be a supporting contractor to the primary contract. And as I was, as we were going through all of this, I also remembered my times in Iraq and Afghanistan where people just came in and then left uh, immediately thereafter. And Ukraine is considerably different than those in that it is a functioning country, but has a functioning government. And I just was basically saying, for those of you that know about Hong Kong, <clears throat> we've basically been in lockdown for two and a half years. And I was telling our teams, I said, you know what? If I can run this company across all of these countries and continents from the 31st floor of a building in Hong Kong, then I can do it from Ukraine. 
And I said, I want my actions to be my statement. I don't want to just fly in, start something, and then leave it. And going through the complexities of opening up in Ukraine, there were probably maybe only five out of our 700 staff that would be possibly capable of coming in and starting this. And I just basically at one point said, what? I'm going to do it. I'm at this stage of my career. This is what I'm going to do. And I was telling our people, if you, if I have a chance to make a difference, that's a chance I have to take. And the more we started, you know, the more we started getting into this, all of these different oblasts or states or provinces, as they're called here, or oblasts, but they're, they're states or provinces, as we refer to them in many of the other countries, started sending these investment profiles. And like everybody around the world, my visions in Ukraine were the gold domes of the Sofia Cathedral or cannons and guns in a wheat field or some the horrible destruction of Mary. And these small cities started coming around. And Emily, they were like out of a Disney movie. They had castles and big churches and old history. And I was telling her people, I said, this is what I want our brand to be. I don't want to be just another expat, another foreign company opening up in Kiev. No, I want to be a part of the small town where we can actually make a difference and have a much higher multiplier effect than we would in Kiev. <clears throat> and in our furniture rental business, mattresses are not the most important thing we have. And so with mattresses, they consume a tremendous amount of volume in the containers. Um, and so I said, are there any distressed or mattress factories in Ukraine that are in trouble? And so I was very looking around and I, that's how I came across this little town of Kremenets. And with Kremenets, it was, I, I went here, I toured the town and reached out with the factory and it's been an amazing experience. And so when I got here, Kremenets is a town of 20,000 people, 40% unemployment, 3,500 refugees, then most of the men are on the front lines. And I was meeting with the mayor and I said, and the city council, I said, do you need any mattresses? Because we're producing these mattresses in the factory and there's not really retail distribution channels as you would have in North America. And I goes, well, we don't have the budget. We don't. I said, no, no, we'll, we'll donate. And that's what engendered rest assured, where we started donating mattresses to the refugees, the internally displaced, the orphans, and, and now the military. And so it's all taken on a life of its own. As of today, we've delivered over two thousand, uh, over 4,000 mattresses all across Ukraine. So it, it, it's very impressive. And uh, with all this, I'm still trying to understand your internal motives. Why? Because there are many businessmen in the world and many I might be less, who are trying to do their best, who are trying to play their role and walk the talk, uh, but not so many people would uh, relocate uh, uh, to the country during the war time, actually without language, without local connections, which I believe you have now, but initially, without actually experience being in uh, Eastern European country, which is slightly different even from Hong Kong you spent time before. How, well, first of all, how is your Ukrainian now, Ukrainian language? And what pushed you actually to be in the center of all these activities on the ground? Yeah. Uh, let me first answer the question about why I came here. And I think, I mean, well, enough, but, uh, I actually, I don't have to work. I've been very blessed throughout my career and worked very hard, super hard. I just, it, if, if I've got this opportunity to utilize and employ my skill sets and the, those that I've acquired in reconstruction and development and investing and furniture rental, because I think I have nine locations in Western Europe. And so I'm sitting there going, I, I want to be able to do this. And for me, it was quite easy to just sit there and go, hey, if this is the last large action of my career, and I can go in there and help this nation in any way I can, then that's something I want to do. And I, as I started donating the mattresses, I remember so many of the uh, charities, and especially in Iraq and Afghanistan, that would go in and just round up the children, have photos, and I take go back to New York City or, or London. Again, I want my actions to be my statement. I want to be here amongst these people because I think. 
as, as important as our monetary investment is in the country, I think it's an equally important investment that people know that I'm here better than most. As a U.S. citizen, I can leave any time. I choose to be here. And for the people in Kremenitz, that's quite inspiring they, that I keep coming back, that I keep being an active member of the community, being a leading corporate citizen. And that's been one of the most gratifying things for me since starting this. Now, as to my Ukrainian, no, I know, what is it, Torba, Dobre Day, Jakuyu, and Super. I think that's it. Super, it's a super. Yeah. It's international. <laughs> <laughs> and despite your, I would say, limited knowledge in Ukrainian and even Russian, which would help you in the situation, I found through the picture, through the post you're sharing, yeah, that you are really getting together with local people who obviously don't speak English, I believe. But uh, so there is something that probably shared by you or coming through you, from you, which attract people to you. And it's not only actual help, addresses, common work, common purpose. When I see, when I saw your smile, when you're interacting with Ukrainian children in orphanage or in some meetings with local people, I see all the happiness and uh, actually openness to connect. And actually, you already connected with people. But I'm just wondering how you manage it with a, a limited language. So what is working here? connection through compassion that everybody understands. And when people start asking if I'm learning Ukrainian, I basically say, no, I'm not. I don't really have the time to learn Ukrainian. What is more important, what's more valuable, that I spend time investing in building the businesses here or go through a, a personal enrichment exercise to learn Ukrainian. What's amazing, because I know you've got such a celebrated career in expatriate and, and relocation. When I, we, we've been the largest furniture rental company in relocation for many years. You know, What's interesting here is how I've had to change my entire management style. <laughs> Unlike when I started in Dubai or Western Europe or Hong Kong, Singapore, those places speak English. Um, here, I can actually go the entire day often and not talk to anybody because no one speaks English. But what it does is it forces you to step out of a role of being like more of a salesperson and into a managerial role of setting standards. This is what we'll do. This is what we want to do. These are our procedures and processes. And that has enabled us to have a very firm foundation on how to build a serious company, even during this horrible time. Now, with regards to the compassion, Ukrainians are very smart. They're, they're street smart and, and they're highly intelligent people. They know if someone is trying to take advantage of them or not. And no better than most, the default position in this culture is it's a, they're reluctant to trust anyone. And gaining the trust of Ukrainians is very difficult because it's just the culture that you just don't trust. And I understand that. In fact, I was even told when you first go into a meeting with a Ukrainian business person, you never smile because if you smile at the first meeting, they think you're up to something. And I said, that's just, I'm not going to sit around and act like some tough guy with, with in, in, in black clothes and a black man, but I'm just going to be who I am. Sensitive to the culture. But when you start doing these acts of compassion again and again, and they realize it's not a one-off. It's not that I came in, found an orphanage, delivered 100 mattresses. Where's another one? Oh, there's an elderly center. There's another 100 mattresses. Every week, we're making these deliveries. And not just in Kremenets or General, we're making them all across the nation. And I have never once purposely, Emily, I've never asked a single person in this country for a grivna, for a dollar, for a favor. Every single mattress I've donated has been for me and my side. I've never asked for discounts. I've never asked for terms. I've always paid cash up front. I've always done this. But the only thing I've asked people to do is if they're in a faraway place, I say, you arrange the transportation. You know, as a way, if you want the mattresses, that's fine. They're all free. But you arrange the transportation. I will be there because I personally deliver every single mattress, whether it's in Zaporizhia, Avdivka, Bakhmut, Kiev, wherever it is, I will deliver every personal mattress. And we've been very blessed because our what we've been doing is garnered a lot of regional and national publicity. 
we have been, I'm very proud to say this, you know Nova Boshta, right? No. It's similar to, say, a Serpetix ground in the United States. And they are so pleased with what we're doing that they will actually arrange the shipments free of charge from our factory in Clemens to wherever we're going. So that I did accept. <laughs> but they see that we're delivering a lot of these to not just foster homes, but we've been doing a tremendous amount with the military and with the military hospitals. Yes, I, I actually would like to commend to you, and I believe that it's uh, pivoting innovation from your business side uh, as well to creating these specific fabrics and specific special covers uh, for the mattresses to be used on the front line in the hospitals. It's something new that you invented being recently in Ukraine. I did, yes. And the reason I invented that is because we only, from your, if you're an expatriate on the ground, that's fast. We have to be more observant than most other people because usually if we're on a rotation, we have a limited amount of time to make an impact. We, we know if it's a two-year or three-year term, it takes about four or five, six months to get the lay of the land, the organization, our customers, stakeholders. Then we've got an opportunity to actually do the job. And then the last six months, we're winding down, getting ready for repatriation or whatever it is. So we have to be as expats or as, as people that are managers of expats. It's my job to remove as many excuses as possible. And so coming here, being on the ground, when we started delivering mattresses to the troops, some of the commanders were telling us that they love the mattresses, but yet on the front, they were getting soiled very quickly, uh, that they were becoming wet. And it's one of those things like, that's so obvious. Why didn't we think of that? And so as soon as that, that revelation came to me, I immediately went about to invent the Trident military mattress cover that could fit over our mattresses. And they can actually be used without a mattress, filling with leaves and straw and grass. That type of innovation. And we, for the hospitals, it was important that we came up with not just a plastic, because it had to be something that was also soft to the skin for patients that you know, have bandages that aren't always in, in pajamas or hospital gowns. And we're very proud of that product. And it's uh, good that you found required materials because I understand during the war, and I don't know, maybe you found suppliers from other countries, but to find this uh, special material and really so quickly to to build all the work to produce it. How long did, did it take from you? Door to door, this line of business. Six weeks. Unbelievable. I'll take okay. that. I, I usually don't like to accept credit for things, but getting, and again, this is where as a senior executive, as, as a, which, which I, I qualify, you're in, and since I'm the sole shareholder, the only owner of Home Essentials, I'm able to clear away all the, you know, all the constituencies, all the, oh, we tried this back in 79 and it didn't work. Or we looked at, you know, focus on this, bum, 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 bum. This is a priority. And we have gifted people that are working for us. Just some of the most amazing people I've been associated with. As the executive, it's, it's my job to focus when an issue comes up, immediately assessing, is it a real issue or is it something that should be just brushed away? If it's a real issue, Better find out what it is, identify, quantify, and then resolve it. And that's what we were able to do. And yes, of course, sourcing, we have uh, all the machines and the skilled personnel in the factory to do it, but finding a, the, the necessary materials that allow it to be waterproof, yet breathable, soft to the touch, but not absorbent. It was, that's why, that's why we, we got a patent. Uh, by the way, who gets this idea to put uh, together with mattresses picture done by children? Uh, and I've seen one of the uh, actual pictures you meddled with children <laughs> working on the, these pictures. I'm just laughing. But uh, I think it's really heartwarming for soldiers on the front line and even for me, for everyone who sees such a nice actually first gift i would say for for wounded uh, soldiers for, for soldiers on the front line but it, it was your idea because i cannot say that the marketing 
uh, innovation. It's, it's, it's something else. Yes. That's very kind of you. Uh, and again, when you're on the ground and you're observing things, then if you've, if you've had a, and the reason gray haired people like myself still have jobs is because we're able to rely on our experience. It was basically back in the end of May last year. And Kremnitz had gone through a really, really tough time. So many people uh, had paid the ultimate price. And, you know, friends of mine had this thing called Sabone's Trust. They're out of Scotland. They basically have this thing where they go around Ukraine delivering free pizzas. And I was meeting with them in Lviv, and I just said, hey, how do we get you to Kremenets? And so we arranged a day for them to come to Kremenets. Then uh, I said, we're going to do pizzas. And we may as well have a carnival, a fair, where we have a, a father's and family and father's day celebration. And so we had street vendors, we had M&M people, minion people, face painters, some music from the local academy and drawing. And so I said, if they're going to be here, they, because the Ukrainian children are very artistic. They love to draw. And I said, well, why don't we set up these tables where they can create Father's Day cards? We had seen some of this when I had delivered to some of the orphans just because the orphans had given me cards. And I was like, wow, that's very touching. No one's ever, no one's ever really given me a card. And, and then when I'm watching all this unfold, I realized that the week after, 10 days after this event, I was actually going to be 20, mi- 20 kilometers from the Russian border on the front lines. And I would also be visiting a military hospital in Kharkiv. And I would also be on the front lines of another place, south, southwest, southeast of Kharkiv. And so I said, why don't we take some of these cards and I will deliver them with the mattresses and the labels on those mattresses said they're from the Grateful Children of Criminals. Emily, off the charts, one of the most amazing things I did for a time. The, the soldiers, when they're looking at these cards from these children, they were touched, visibly touched. And it's not anything I can invent. I just, I was just lucky enough, fortunate enough to be the one that delivered it. And the commander, I can send you the photo later. I'm giving the commander all these cards. And he wells up. He goes, I'm from Nyak Clemens. And it, it just, I, I can't explain it. They were just visibly touched and moved. And I was just blessed to be a part. As far as I understand, uh, you are planning to extend in Ukraine, uh, business-wise. I know that you pioneer in furniture rental business and you build such a network of uh, stores, I believe. Oh, it's actually online purchase and stores in Asia, in Africa, in India. And, but war is still going on in Ukraine. How you how you planning to expand in Ukraine as of now? Because you had very ambitious plans to have many stores, I believe, till the end of 20. So it will be rental stores. Please just clarify how you see your future expansion, <laughs> if I can say. That is a very fair question. We are the only furniture rental company in places like Spain, Portugal, Italy, France, and in Ukraine. And our business in Ukraine, we have two locations now, and I'll have 25 by the end of 25. And again, I understand that since I'm the sole shareholder of Home Essentials globally, I don't have to answer questions to a board of directors or lenders or private equity or shareholders. So I've got a lot more freedom than some of my friends in similar positions. So the issue of insurance, I can just sit there and make that judgment call myself. We don't have it. But what happened is once I got to prominence, my customers are, are your customers, IBM, Colgate, General Electric, DuPont, GlaxoSmithKline, Accenture. They're, they're sending expatriates to these different cities like Singapore, and they'll rent furniture from us. You, 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 DSPs and RSPs will, will be involved. And so we are a primarily a furniture rental company for you know embassies and multinational expatriates. As of now, I'm really about the only expatriate uh, in Ukraine. There's a lot of government work, uh, NGO work, and, and a foreign embassy work. When I opened up a store in Clemenets, it's like a home essential store you'd find in Hong Kong or Barcelona. And what happens is the, 
it wasn't doing as well as I'd hoped because the furniture has been expensive. These people are at war. And so we were, we were doing more of a retail format than, than furniture rent. And again, because I'm on the ground, what happened was this one couple had come in. It was their third time. Was, and I was talking to them through the interpreter and Google Translate. And I said, man, may I help you? They just said, oh, we love this bed and mattress. I said, okay, great. And they go, we're saving for it. I said, okay. We think that in October or November, we'll have enough cash that we'll come in and buy it. And I just innocently said, how much can you afford per month? They looked shocked. And they said, what do you mean? I said, no, just give me a number of how much you would like to pay per month. And let me see. And they gave me a number. I said, I'll tell you what, we're going to deliver this bed mattress to you tomorrow. Shocked. And they go, well, we have to go. I said, no, there's no banks. Because Ukrainians, especially in Western Ukraine and the older generation, don't trust the banks. <laughs> I said, no interest. Take this price, divide it by 12. That's it. No delivery fees, no hidden charges. Here's the agreement. It's two pages. It's that simple. My gosh, they were excited. And since, since you have a, a, a personal connection with Ukraine, what happens three hours later? Guess who comes storming through that door? Their daughter. And in my day, we've helped over 100,000 expatriates. And I've had some angry customers, as we all have. And this one scared me. And she came in there and she started shaking that finger. And she goes, we know when an American came to town. I'm the only American in this whole region. When an American came to town, something would happen. Somehow, you were going to do something. I said, wait, what are you talking about? She goes, my parents are on a pension. They only have this much. And I said, whoa, wait. Yeah, one, I don't charge them anything until we deliver. I haven't taken any money from them. So if they want to cancel, they can cancel. Two, I, you know, you, look, if it's 1000 if it's $1,200, they are paying 100 a month or whatever it is. It's, there's no interest. She goes, well, and you, wh- where's the banks? I said, I'm the bank. We don't use banks. And she looked and gave me a stern eye, and she goes, why would you do that? <laughs> I said, I said uh, that's... I said, and first of all, may I get your name? And she goes, Olga. I said, Olga, this is and this is a variant, a twist of what I do every single day around the world. Whether it's furniture rental or higher purchase or whatever, it's the same basic model. That's all I'm doing. We have a lot of furniture. We have a lot of inventory. We give it out to customers for a fraction of that each month. And since then, the word is spread and we're filling a very vital role in the local marketplace, one that no one else is doing. We're the first company in Ukraine to offer 0% financing. And that we, don't ask, we don't ask any challenging questions. We're not asking to see bank statements. We're not calling up friends to see if they're at credit risk. We're not wanting to see the deed or title to their homes or any of that stuff. And Ellie, this is exactly the way the furniture rental business started in the 1960s in the USA. And I've been dusting off all of those business plans and going through and, and basically doing the same thing. And it's worked out very well. So we're able to expand in Ukraine because we've got this model that if I was doing this in Kiev, it would be totally different. But here, I ain't the same many of these people and the, the rural people in these small towns, they're, they're good people. Okay, They're really good people. Solid people. If I was to offer this in Kiev, people say, wait a second, you're going to give me a house of free furniture and then I'm going to come in and pay you every month. Yeah. Okay. Deliver tomorrow and then good luck finding me tomorrow. Your credit assessment, your risk profile in, in Kiev would be quite a bit higher than, than it is out here. But, you know, but there is a difference always between big cities, capital vibe and mentality and people in countryside. And uh, I'm listening to you with. Uh, great interest uh, because I lived in Ukraine. I'm not originally from Ukraine, but I lived in Western Ukraine, which is different, in Dnipro, and I've been only like a tourist in a, in, in Western Ukraine. I lived in Eastern, more kind of Russian-speaking, different mentality, and I've heard, I knew that there's differences 
uh, between people here and there, even because uh, historical reasons. They were part of Poland, they were part of Austro-Hungarian Empire, less time under Soviet Union. All this impacted the generational, I would say, upbringing. Uh, but people itself, I personally found, and I was born in small place in Moldova, which is a little bit south, yes, of Ukraine. And very often uh, visited Ukraine in Soviet time. Actually, it was one country, even uh, different. The, the borders were just on the map. Mm. Uh, I understand that many things uh, changed since I left Soviet Union more than uh, 30 years ago. And I am uh, communicating with uh, many Ukrainian people here in Toronto, in Canada, in other places. But again, it's a people who left country. They had different vibes, mostly young people, uh, educated people who, oh, now it's a refugee lately, which I'm involved as well. But I'm very interested uh, in your experience uh, meeting with people on the ground, I say, in such a small but middle-sized city as Eminets, and I read the, the article, actually, you prompted me a year ago to read in Wikipedia to learn more about this city and about this region. And what I was thinking, actually, listening to you now, is that for me, and I believe for Ukrainian people, specifically from Western Ukraine, you represent the best of American people. When there are different conversations now, and I'm listening to different podcasts and news, and there are some, I would say, different opinions about Ukraine coming from the United States. We belong to one generation, I believe. And with all our differences in upbringing and education, and uh, some people are lost, especially young people, there is my pain that the young generation actually lost. They don't appreciate what good countries they are living. They don't know, don't appreciate American history and actually what uh, America as a state achieved. I'm really happy that you bring this, this American uh, spirit and I'm not speaking about entrepreneurship only, about uh, personal courage, about uh, really passion that you bring and communicating with people, again, without language. I believe you have some translators <laughs> because it, I cannot imagine how you can uh, manage this business development, even machinery and all this. And I hope, I know that local government supporting you and I'm very happy it's what needs to be done. And um, again, I personally really touched every time I see your new post in uh, LinkedIn and with all what you're doing, again, coming to the question I've had uh, uh, from the beginning, because I don't know if you remember, I told you more than a year ago that after a year living in Ukraine, you will be a different person. And I am. And I, I guess uh, how I can answer some of this one, I, I appreciate the compliments. I don't believe that I'm representing America or the best of America or anything like that. And that's not my motivation. But what I will tell you is that at the end of my career, at the end of my life, at some point I will be accountable. Okay. And I've been given a tremendous amount. Do I want the end of my life to me be sitting at home with my family and, and the, on a top a rooftop of a penthouse in Hong Kong where we live and talking about photos of when I was in Ukraine and how dangerous it was. If I've actually been given this, the, the skills, these talents, the, this abundance, and I just hoard it all for myself, what good is that? If I have a chance to make a difference, that's a chance I have to take. And so that's my primary motivation. Now, I realize that there are a lot of people that would probably like to do that, and they don't, and they can't, you know, whether it's family commitments, job commitments, all those things. I never compare myself with anyone else because we're all on our own journey, Emily. We all have to make our own decisions. We all have an ability to influence and impact within the constraints that our lives have put us in. And so if I am so blessed to have this ability, this freedom to do it, then that's what I'm doing. And uh, it's not about, oh, look at what I'm doing. Why, where's everybody else? No, everybody else's is up to them. 
but this is how I feel for my life. And I've been very blessed to do it. And Nipro is a big city. I've been there many times. We're supplying the hospitals there. But, and, but in rural Ukraine, and these are these are just really good people. And they need hope just as much as everybody else does. And so that's one of the things to answer your earlier question. That shines through. That They know that I'm here. And one, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, one of the things that people still can't believe is they go, I, and since you're from Moldova and you've, lived, you've been in Western Ukraine, there's a tremendous amount, a number of street dogs. And I make it a point every day to feed the street dogs. And I don't just feed them. I go to the butcher and I get good quality meat and I go out and I find the street and the street dogs, I'll find me, but, and I'll sit down and I'll feed those street dogs. Because what is is someone supposed to do? Go around to these dogs and and pet them and say, God bless you. And then what's going to happen? Someone else is going to feed them? I mean, these dogs need food, need attention, just like everybody else. What kind of person am I if I go around just talking and saying all these beautiful, pretty words and then don't take care of the dogs or don't take care of the people or or don't spend time with the orphans? Don't spend time with the elderly. If you've reached, and as business leaders, if, if you've reached a certain level, and then I tell our teams that our business needs to be like you know, two wheels on a rail track. One is generating profits and generating revenue, operating a, a successful business so that provides cash flow so that we can then redeploy a, that some of that cash back into the communities. We need to be active in our community. And like I said, this is better than most. The Ukrainians are very smart. Okay. They know what's happening. And if they perceive that I am just here for a limited amount of time, building a big company only for me, what does that say? That okay, well, That's not the best of America. What America is known for in a lot of circles, American companies coming in, taking up the market share, talking about one thing and then doing the other. But here, uh, and also one quick point, not that I have not asked the local governments anywhere for anything. I believe that is 100% wrong. A thousand percent law that a company of our size would go in and ask any of these local governments for concessions under no circumstances. These governments are all strained. These governments, they don't have the money to do this. They don't have the money to give the refugees mattresses. And I'm not going in asking for tax breaks or you know, concessions of any kind. One of the things that, that I think when you're spent mentioning the younger generation, where I was a a degree in history. My Chinese history uh, probably isn't as applicable as me growing up as an American. But 47 years ago, there were a, some of the most enlightened men that ever walked the face of this planet were told that you're stupid, you're peasants, you're farmers, you're not sophisticated, you're backwards. And they said, no, we're just as smart as you. We're people, we have the same rights as, as you. And they were told, no, just be quiet, pay your taxes and do this. So they decided to make a declaration of independence. And they went against the world superpower and uh, a, a country infinitely more advanced than they militarily, and they prevailed. And through that uh, prevailing, they came up with the Constitution and our Bill of Rights. I see the exact same scenario in Ukraine today. Ukrainians in 2003 and 2014, they made a unequivocal No go back choice to go with democracy, freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom to determine their own life, and freedom of acquaintance and orientation and all those things. They're now paying the price for those freedoms. And nothing against Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, Latvia, uh, Lithuania, Estonia. When they received their freedom in 89 and 91, they didn't die for it. Now, they, they'd sacrifice, don't get me wrong. Ukrainians are dying for their freedom. They're having to, like Israel, wake up every morning and having to defend their right to, why is an America, the best of America would be that Americans are coming out here to support, that America is out here supporting a country that is going through the exact same foundational building that the United States went. And one of the most inspiring things that I've seen since coming out here is the role of civil society. And most Americans don't know what civil society is, and that's fine. It's like 
what was it? Probably about six months ago. When we first started doing deliveries to the military, I had one person write in saying, oh, but I think you're a fraud. You know, and you'll always get shaming stuff for people online saying that. It's like, you're not delivering mattresses to the military. They already have huge budgets to do all that. And I just basically told this guy, who's in Singapore, by the way, I said, why don't you come out here and, and, and see for yourself? This isn't the Pentagon, okay? This military doesn't even have enough money to make sure it's paying its troops, getting the munitions to the front line. When these soldiers need T-shirts and socks and batteries, they're sending messages back to their villages. And those people are gathering up those supplies and sending them to the front lines. That is, is crucial and critical for this country winning this war as anything. And civil society playing. And, and again, that's exactly what happened during the American Revolution. The Continental Congress providing General Washington with the money and arms that he needed. It were the people in the, in the rural areas, not in Boston and New York and Worcester and Sakana and Hartford and, and those small towns giving the, 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 the Continental Army, General Washington's troops, the supplies and food that they needed to survive. And that's what I'm seeing happening here. And that's what's been most inspiring. Did you spend some time uh, back then when uh, you developed your business in uh, Kabul, in Afghanistan, in Iraq? Like, did it happen that you spent time with locals, how it's now with Ukraine? No, I was in, it was in Baghdad and Kabul quite often. That was a different dynamic altogether. One, uh, we were seen as assisting occupiers. Okay. Now, while many people were grateful that U- U.S. and coalition troops were there. There were sizable constituencies that were not. And, and our movements were somewhat, especially in Iraq, limited after October 2003 when the uprising started. And, and, and there, our customers were limited to you know, not foreign companies, foreign governments or the U.S. government or, or those types of things. So you, know, you didn't have really the chance to interact. There was no way that I could have lived in a small town in Afghanistan or Iraq during that time. And here, it's a totally different thing. And, and also, I'm able to come in before the cessation of hostilities. In Iraq and Afghanistan, we had to go in on the back of coalition forces. Tell me, please, you mentioned several times in your latest uh, interview from the ground, as they say, that you will be in Ukraine as long as it takes. Yes. Do you see yourself living in Ukraine for the next couple of years? Or? Yeah, I do. I have no reason to go anywhere else. My family's still in Hong Kong. And, it's, and, and so we still have a house in Hong Kong. We still have a residence in Madrid. I'm mean, Yeah, there's no reason for me to go anywhere else. I want this to be the last big thing of my career. We believe, though it changes often, but we believe that this is a five to six, eight year plan. Eight year plan. I believe that it will be really many years needed to reconstruct Ukraine or to build infrastructure which was destroyed by war and actually uh, to build it better than it was. And when you say about the last chapter of your career, I don't think about you in these terms. And even my actually new topic is uh, age of reinvention and how to find freedom and purpose being after 50, I will not ask you for soul searching in this direction because you actually have a life example presentation how it's possible and realistically you living this life of freedom of your choice, freedom to move where you feel it's better where actually your soul and business my intuition is uh, going and you don't need to find purpose because you have it and you have it for years. Uh, again, the reason I started to think about this topic, because as I see, look around, I understand, first of all, some baby boomer, younger generation going to retire or already retired. Yes, and still active and young and having professional skills which can be utilized. And from other side, there will be pretty many professions soon to be displaced by AI tools. That's, it's how I see, not all, but many of them. So it will be enough people active, I care more about 50 plus, 
who would be looking how to reinvent and what to do alive for the next 20, 30, 40 years. So what do you would advise for these people? Two years ago, I would have never thought I'd be sitting in Kremlin's Ukraine talking to you. Um, because even then, that was mid-March. So we were basically not even a month into the conflict uh, two years ago. And let, let me be honest. I, I've gone through tragedy. I've gone through near collapse. I've gone through business reversals and setbacks. I've made a lot of money and I've lost a lot. It's not like Bill Gates where I'm just on a, a solid upward trajectory. And I think that for those of us that are this age, we have to realize that we've gained a lot of experiences. Now, as for AI taking us out or something like that, I can't comment on that. I don't think AI is going to be opening up furniture stores or replacing furniture in, in rural Ukraine anytime soon. But so I'm, I'm insulated on that. But what I'm getting at is you need to be prepared for opportunities when they arise. It's I, I think you would admit what I'm doing is extremely unique, but it's unique to me because even my father used to be the CEO of a, a retailer in the United States. I would go on store tours with him in the, in, in the early 70s, you know, and see those towns. And he grew up in a small town. Even though I grew up in a, a very privileged big town, I learned respect of those people. I learned how they are different yet the same. We can all be Americans, but they act and think differently. And oftentimes they act and think with a lot more integrity and ethics than people in, in, in my own suburbs did. I am blessed that the sum of all of my experiences enabled me to see through the eyes of those experiences what I could do here. So, yeah, is this the last thing of my career? I don't know. But I'm sure happy that I'm here now and I have no desire to do it, to do anything else. And I'm not burdened by saying, oh, I've got like a, a two-year window or a one-year window or something like that. No, I'm here for as long as it takes. I, I can do it. We don't have, like I said, shareholders or equity or lenders breathing down my neck saying, hey, you missed your plan. Where's your revenue targets? Justifiable questions for sure. But I can make sure that we build a, a damn good business here. One that's profitable, one that, that is expansion, one that, that is cash flow positive, one that benefits our communities, and one that is a tool to give back. And so again, for people our age, look for a purpose, look for those experiences that you had in the past that are most pleasing to you, and keep the eyes open for the potential opportunities that may arise when they do, because you just don't know. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. And there is one question, which is obviously not about you, and I hope not about me, uh, but which the final question that I'm asking each of my guests, because I'm developing this uh, topic after 50, and uh, some people around 60 considering themselves or afraid to be old, all this industry of rejuvenation, and it, it's all okay. <laughs> but my question is, in your opinion, when and what age person became old? Actually, what is defined to be old and what might help people to be active and young for the long years to come? Uh, I'm asked that question a lot, especially at this age, and my family knows it. I actually don't really think about retirement. Uh, Moses led Israel at the age of 80. Caleb took a hill at the age of 85. Abraham was 75, 80 years old when, when he left his hometown. Sam Walton was 45 when he found at Walmart. In Asia, we say age is just a number, and that's convenient. Obviously, I am older. I'm, I'm not like I was when I was in my early 20s, where I could, I could work two, three days straight without sleeping. But you have to have a passion. And it doesn't have to be a red-hot passion or some Joan of Arc type passion. But it, uh, you need to have something that engages you. And the minute you're not engaged, then you're retired. And I believe the minute you're not engaged, that's when the aging process begins to accelerate. And, and I also think that there's something where we have to reconcile as alluring as it would be to wake up in the mornings and go to the country club and play golf or tennis. And I'm not saying anything against people that do that, but I just don't want to do that. I, I, I don't see that the Bible ever talks of, um, there's only one place in the Bible that 
it talks about retirement. <clears throat> and that's in uh, 2 Samuel 19, when Barzillai is invited by King David to go back to Jerusalem. And he says, no, I'm old. I'd just rather stay here and die. And so in my belief system, there really isn't a talk about retirement. Again, you have an ability to give back. And golly, I can't give back on a golf course. I can't give back having gin tonics with friends on the roof. I can, but it's just, you've got an ability to have a positive impact on the lives of others. And yes, Emory, like you said, I'm a changed person. Am I changed because of Ukraine? No. Am I changed because I'm a great guy? Absolutely not. I'm changed because for the first time in my career, or since I got started, I can see firsthand how what I'm doing is benefiting those around me. And again, that's because I'm in the small town. If I was in Kiev, <clears throat> working in one building, leading teams, you know, what's, what's the difference between Kiev, Madrid, Hong Kong, Chicago? They're all similar. Here, you sit around and, and you see these people. And what you're doing is making a difference. And yes, I, it uh, engenders not only goodwill within the community, but it makes me feel good about myself as well. I think that for those of us that are at this age, we have a lot to give back that AI cannot console and talk to people and offer collaborative consultation like what you're doing. You know, bringing these threads together, seeing what are the common denominators that drive people after 50 to still want to make a difference and not budget how much they're going to be able to spend each month through retirement savings. Much. I can only add from my side for this question that be curious, continue to be curious, continue to learn a new skill, language it. Even you will not uh, be perfect, obviously, but try to give food for soul and mind being in any age. And I think and you will be young and active because it's actually what distinguish young people from um, uh, old and by the way, retirement for me, in my definition and what I do, it's the best chapter of the life. Should be. It's a time when, by major standard, you already raise your family, you already get to maturity, <laughs> spiritual and uh, professional, and you uh, have less responsibilities. Even the different there is a, uh, some elderly parents for some of us, children, grandchildren. But it's a time when you really have freedom to do what you can to utilize, and I don't like this, uh, or your knowledge and experience and to find freedom in doing it because you do it because you feel mm, that it's needed to be done like you did before. And learning new skills, as I'm learning now, podcasting <laughs> and trying to actually invite guests like you. There's not so many like you, but to li- it's a real stories of people who made it and continue to work, being after 50, 60, 70. I believe it's all of, in reality. It's what we need just to find the purpose and work, sometimes hard, toward it. And we are always young and active. And, and to that point, Emily, while I'm not learning Ukrainian, the, the local college has asked me to co-teach class at the local college on English literature and English uh, language skills, which I gladly do. And then that gives me an opportunity to interact with 20-year-olds and you know, understand the nuances on what they're thinking and how they perceive things and see things. And it also gives them a glimpse to ask me questions. And I, because at my age, I want to make sure that I'm approachable. And so I've learned a lot from them and, and co-teach. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Chris, and today I was together with uh, Chris Xline. Please remember this name and story. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Have a great evening.